One of you is the infamous serial killer, Jack the Ripper. One to five detectives will chase him through the streets of London over the course of four nights and try to catch him before he disappears forever. This is Letters from Whitechapel. Lay out the game board and choose one player to play as Jack. Divvy up the five police pawns amongst the rest of the group, however you collectively feel, and give everyone a reference card. Give Jack a fresh move track sheet, a pencil, all the crime scene markers, clue markers, the alley and coach special movement tokens, the time of the crime token, and the Jack the Ripper screen to hide the move track sheet behind. Place a black Jack pawn on the first night space of the game board. Jack then chooses any numbered circle on the board to act as his hideout, and secretly writes that number in the oval at the top of the move track sheet. His goal will be to return to his hideout without being caught after each murder. One of the detectives shuffles the head of investigation tokens and puts them in a face-down pile on their space on the game board. Put the wretched pawns and police patrol tokens somewhere they can be reached by everyone, or at least most of you. The game is divided into four nights. Each night is divided into two parts, and each part has a few different phases. They're all listed on the reference cards, and each phase will name either Jack the Ripper or the police as the active party. Phase 1. Jack collects his special movement tokens. He'll have all of them on the first night, but each night he'll get less to work with. Phase 2. Jack collects a number of white women tokens depending on the night. Some of these women will be marked with a red dot on one side. These are Jack's possible targets. The unmarked women are fake targets used to distract the police. Jack secretly places each of these tokens face down on a red circle of his choice. From the second night on, Jack cannot place women on any spaces that have been marked with a red crime scene token. Phase 3. The detectives turn over the top token on the head of investigation pile. The player controlling that policeman is the head of the investigation for the night. At this point during the first night, the head of the investigation places each of the seven police patrol tokens face down on the yellow bordered crossings on the board. Crossings are black squares. Some of these tokens are marked on one side with a colored circle matching each of the five detectives. Two of them are blank, decoys used only to confuse Jack. From the second night on, these tokens will be placed among seven locations according to the following rules. Five of them must be placed on the positions occupied by the police pawns at the end of the previous night. The tokens need not match the color of those pawns and may even be decoys. The remaining two tokens must be placed on yellow bordered crossings that were not occupied by a police pawn at the end of the previous night. Phase 4. Jack turns all of the women tokens face up. Those marked with a red dot are replaced with wretched pawns, and the fakes are removed. The time of the crime token is then placed on the yellow Roman numeral 1 of the move track. Phase 5. Jack decides whether to kill or wait. If the time of the crime token has reached the Roman numeral 5, he has no choice, as he can resist the urge no longer, and he must kill. If he kills, Jack chooses one wretched pawn on the board and replaces it with a crime scene marker. That pawn and one of the marked woman tokens are returned to the box, and you then skip ahead to phase 8. If, however, Jack chooses to wait, the night continues with phase 6. The time of the crime token moves one space to the left, to the next yellow Roman numeral. Then, the head of the investigation must move each of the wretched pawns along the dotted lines to an adjacent, unoccupied, numbered circle. 
A space is considered adjacent if it is directly connected to another space by a dotted line. Wretched movement must adhere to the following rules. They cannot end their movement on a space that is connected to a crossing with a police patrol token. Their movement cannot cross a police patrol token. And they cannot end their movement in a space containing a crime scene marker. If a wretched has no legal movement, she stays in her current circle. Otherwise, the head of the investigation must move each of the wretched pawns one space. Phase 7. Jack's patience is rewarded, as he may reveal any of the police patrol tokens on the board. If it is a decoy, it is removed. Otherwise, it remains face up on the board. Then, return to phase 5, where Jack once again must choose whether to kill or wait. Phase 8. Once Jack kills, he writes down the numbered space marked by the crime scene token in the row corresponding to the current night and the column corresponding to the Roman numeral matching the time of the crime token's current position. This is Jack's current location. For the rest of the night, he will be moving along the dotted lines to connected numbered circles, trying to get back to his hideout without being caught. He now places the second Jack Pawn on the move track, on the space marked by the time of the crime token. Phase 9. The detectives now reveal any police patrol tokens that haven't been already, then replace the marked ones with their matching coloured police pawns, and remove any remaining decoys, as well as the rest of the wretched. Phase 1. Jack moves from his current numbered circle to another connected to it by a dotted line. He may not move over a crossing occupied by a police pawn. If this prevents Jack from being able to move at all, he is caught and the detectives win the game. He writes down the number of his new location in the next empty space to the right on his move track. He then advances the Jack Pawn on the move track on the board, one space to the right, so that it always corresponds with the column of the location he just wrote down on his sheet. If he wishes, instead of moving normally, Jack may spend a special movement token. The coach token allows Jack to move through two locations at once, like a double move. It also allows him to move through crossings occupied by police pawns, the two locations involved in such a movement must be different from each other and from the space in which he started the move from. Both locations are noted in succession on the move track sheet, and the jack pawn on the game board track moves forward two spaces. The coach token is placed on the move track so that it covers both of those two spaces. The alley token allows Jack to cross a block of houses, moving to any numbered circle that borders the same housing block as the space he currently occupies. A housing block is any area completely bounded, but not interrupted, by dotted lines. Jack records his movement as usual and places the alley token on the corresponding space of the game board's move track. Phase 2. The detectives discuss their strategy, and then, starting with the head of the investigation and going clockwise around the table, move the pawn or pawns they control. If a player controls multiple pawns, they decide the order in which to move them. Police pawns move along the dotted lines a distance of up to two crossings. They ignore numbered circles for the purposes of movement. Police may move through crossings occupied by other police, but they may not stop there. Phase 3. Starting with the head of the investigation and going clockwise round the table, each detective player states, for each police pawn they control, whether they are looking for clues or executing an arrest. Each police pawn may only perform one of these two actions. To look for clues, the detective announces the number of a space connected to their pawn's crossing, which is uninterrupted by any other spaces or crossings. 
Jack checks to see if that number appears anywhere in the current night's row on his sheet. If it does, he places a clue marker on that numbered circle, and that police pawn's action ends. If not, the detective may then announce the number of another adjacent space, and the process repeats until either a clue marker has been placed, or all options have been exhausted. To execute an arrest, the detective announces the number of one numbered circle adjacent to their pawn. If that is Jack's current location, he is arrested and the detectives win. Otherwise, the police's action ends with no further information given. Assuming Jack is still at large once all detectives have taken their actions, go back to part two, phase one, where Jack moves to a new location. If Jack ends his movement on his hideout, he may, if he chooses, declare he has escaped for the night, and the night ends. But note that if he chooses not to declare his escape, he will have to move at the start of his next phase. If Jack runs out of time by reaching the end of the move track before reaching his hideout, the detectives win. If he does escape, move the first Jack pawn to the next night space on the game board and return to part one, phase one. On the third night, Jack kills two of the wretched instead of just one. He chooses two victims during part one, phase five, replacing both with a crime scene marker and writes both numbers on his sheet. The first in the space of the column corresponding to the time of the crime marker, the second in the next space to the right. He may record the two numbers in any order he chooses. He then starts his escape from the location of the second of the two murders, and the Jack Pawn begins on the space to the right of the time of the crime marker. If Jack the Ripper manages to kill all five of his victims and escapes to his hideout by the end of the fourth night, he wins. If the police arrest him or prevent him from reaching his hideout on any of the four nights, they win. And that's how you play Letters from Whitechapel. There are also a handful of optional rules which can be implemented to help either side, but we'll leave those to you to discover on your own. Hey, thanks for watching. If you like that, be sure to hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, and most importantly, go on over to twitch.tv slash BNB Tabletop and give us a follow there. We play board games live every Sunday night at 7.30 p.m. Pacific time on a show we call The Board and Barrel. And it's a very interactive broadcast. We have house rules that you guys can influence throughout the course of the game. Virtual bingo. You can bet on who's going to win. It's a lot of fun. And I look forward to seeing you there.